Silent Hill 4 The Room is an odd duck amongst the team's silent entries in the franchise. While there are obvious thematic differences across the original trilogy, this fourth iteration in particular is often looked back upon as an outlier due to key changes it made to the core formula. While Silent Hill 4 is still, fundamentally speaking, a psychologically driven horror game oozing with atmosphere and symbolism, much like the ones that came before it, the overarching structure, on the other hand, is unlike any other in the series, before or since. Instead of seamlessly exploring the familiar town of Silent Hill, the player instead will alternatively go back and forth between their apartment, Room 302, and multiple nightmare worlds manifested by the antagonist Walter Sullivan, all of which are twisted reflections of his childhood. This shift in structure allows for a very different type of horror, one that conditions and in turn challenges how the player perceives their surroundings. When starting a new game, the opening text states that the apartment room has been sealed away from reality and the protagonist Henry Townsend along with it. Thus, the journey begins in the titular Room 302, a filthy, rusty, yet simultaneously fleshy looking apartment, which somehow manages to appear both rotted away, yet eerily alive, as if the environment itself is on the precipice of life and death. Aesthetically speaking, this is honestly nothing too outlandish for what Silent Hill is known for, even down to the use of colors. The method of control, on the other hand, is an entirely different story. For the first time in the series, players are introduced to a first-person perspective, something that is exclusive to this location, a design decision that acts as a thesis statement of the game's intent. When control is given to the player, it's possible to examine multiple objects strewn around the area, which prompts a short description by Henry himself. The funny thing about this, however, is that despite the game making it clear that this is indeed his apartment, curiously, these inner monologues indicate that he doesn't seem to recognize anything as his own, and that previous possessions have been replaced with otherwise foreign objects. What was once a record player is now a TV set. None of the pictures hung up on the walls ring is familiar, and even the shoe size by the door is wrong somehow. This is because we're not actually playing as the main character, Henry Townsend, but rather Joseph Schreiber, the previous tenant of Room 302. While that's the narrative justification for the disparity, this can be extrapolated beyond the game itself and become an allegory for fans of the series. Similar to how Joseph is clearly shaken over the transformation of his home, those familiar with Silent Hill might also be uncomfortable with the new camera perspective clashing against the familiar visuals. In both cases, it's an unsettling merger of the old with the new. Soon after poking around, a decrepit entity emerges from the wall, assaulting Joseph and killing him. Just supposing this disturbing and traumatic event is the apartment transitioning back into something that could be described as perfectly normal. Some might go as far as to call it cozy. It's a stark contrast to the gruesome scene preceding it. Once the intro finishes, the game begins proper by finally transferring over to the main character, Henry Townsend. The purpose of the intro, outside of setting up the story itself and being a bit of meta-commentary concerning fan expectations, is to act as foreshadowing by giving the player a small taste of what is to come. What should be an intimately familiar location for Joseph feels alien and hostile. His belongings aren't where they're supposed to be. The atmosphere is oppressive. This no longer feels like his home anymore. Silent Hill is no stranger when it comes to tapping into multiple facets of the human condition. So despite this entry status as a black sheep for supposedly deviating from the formula, preying on yet another one of humanity's vulnerabilities is firmly in lockstep with the ethos of the franchise. Having tackled abuse, sexual frustration, body image, and other relevant insecurities, it's easy to see the logical progression to then pick apart, brick by brick, the psychological walls we construct in regards to how safe we believe our homes to be. 
In order for Silent Hill 4 to get across its message, the apartment lies at the core of the game experience in order to weave it in mechanically and narratively. Metaphorically speaking, an individual's home is a sacred place, not unlike a holy sanctuary. To take the analogy further, the bedroom, living room, and restrooms are where we perform our daily rituals of eating, sleeping, recreation, and other affairs we'd rather not speak of openly. The common thread running through all of these activities is that they represent us at our most vulnerable. Just being home subconsciously brings our guards down. This is a result of an intense level of intimacy developed by regularly performing these sacred acts over the years with a growing sense of comfort and security. This is why we're so attached to our humble abodes, inspiring wistful feelings of longing when too much time is spent apart. For many, there are few places outside of our personal dwellings where we feel like we can just be ourselves without fear of prying eyes and unwelcome interlopers. Silent Hill 4 attempts to recreate this conditioning, albeit on a smaller scale, so that we, the player, perceive Room 302 in a roughly similar light. A safe, secure location where nothing can harm us as we escape from the dread of the outside world. It already sounds uncomfortably familiar, doesn't it? The disparity between the safety of the apartment and the treacherous nature of what lies beyond is represented by the different levels the player must traverse in, all of which are distortions of familiar, real-world locations, such as a subway and a forest. Speaking of which, how does Henry find his way into these hellish landscapes if he's supposedly trapped in room 302? Well, shortly after taking control of him, an ominous hole appears in his bathroom. With some trepidation, he enters it and uncomfortably crawls through the isolated space, only to find himself transported elsewhere. As the player completes each area in the game, the hole grows larger. Unnerving sounds begin to seep from the orifice and become louder as time goes on. Finally, suspicious runes slowly manifest around the border of the hole itself. While this can come across as just another way to be spooky, there are deeper implications. When traversing these distortions of reality, there are other oddly similar looking holes that can be found while exploring, and entering them will take Henry back to the apartment. However, instead of coming out the other direction and appearing back in the bathroom, he wakes up in his bed implying that these otherworldly ventures are much closer to dreams. Despite that, it's clear that these are no mere bedtime visions. The hole in the bathroom is very real, and it begins to resemble the ones found in the other worlds for a reason. Within the narrative, it indicates that the connection between dreams and reality is growing stronger, but thematically, this goes hand in hand with the idea that our mental health is linked to how we perceive our homes, and just because it's psychological in nature, that doesn't make it any less real or impactful on our lives. Another point of interest concerning the whole is how it specifically appears in Henry's bathroom. On the topic of when we're at our most vulnerable, doing our business on the toilet and taking a bath rank up quite high. On top of being naked in the shower or with our pants down doing what needs to be done on the porcelain throne, people are often preoccupied mentally when they're in the restroom. So not only are we physically susceptible to harm, but we're also mentally distracted. Reflecting on this reveals how this room truly embodies us at our most fragile. It's honestly no wonder why it's become such a horror movie cliche to kill off characters either bathing or showering. It taps into the fear of being attacked where we least expect it and are most susceptible to harm. 
Interestingly, most video games tend not to factor a character's need to make use of the facilities, and that's no different in the Silent Hill series, or even this specific entry for that matter. But when looking at it from Henry's point of view, there appears to be a more in-universe reason behind it. The flavor text, when examining the toilet, explicitly states, it isn't the time for that kind of thing. Given this, it stands to reason that he is intentionally deciding against using it. And who could blame him? It would be absolutely nerve-wracking for anyone to even attempt such things when a gaping maw is mere inches away, especially since it's tethered to hellish landscapes occupied by grotesque creatures that threaten our lives. To add insult to injury, there's a mid-game event that causes the tub to be filled with blood. A clear moment of irony, wherein the very utility we use to cleanse ourselves of the impurities of the outside world itself becomes filthy and tainted. Silent Hill 4, as mentioned earlier, aims to replicate the codependent relationship we have with our homes by placing both narrative and gameplay significance on how the player interacts with Room 302. While this is accomplished through a multitude of methods, they're typically facilitated in some way through the protagonist, Henry Townsend, in both tangible and abstract ways. This works because his characterization is subdued. He's not quite a blank slate, but his personality is muted enough so that it allows the player to more easily impose their own thoughts and feelings onto him. This projection is vitally important to the core experience, as it informs how the game itself is to be perceived, to the point where even something as simple as the camera perspective has a subtle yet distinctive effect. When you're making your way through the nightmare worlds, Silent Hill 4 much more closely resembles its predecessors by not only focusing on exploration and combat, but by utilizing a third-person camera perspective. This creates a strong contrast with the first-person perspective utilized in Room 302 as it physically closes the distance felt during normal gameplay, and in doing so, creates a level of intimacy with the apartment that would not have been as potent had the game opted against switching camera perspectives in order to firmly establish the divide between the two modes of play. This level of closeness results in the player looking at Henry's belongings, and by extension the apartment as their own. This is also achieved via the mechanical benefits of returning to room 302. Namely, there's the notebook for saving, the storage box for item management, and the exceedingly useful health regeneration, all of which reinforces the notion that this is a safe haven and a reprieve from the chaos. While it is required to return to the room in order to progress, these benefits heavily incentivize frequent trips back, allowing the player to naturally grow acquainted with how it's supposed to look and feel, thus making it easier to notice when something is amiss. The game effectively preys upon this growing sense of familiarity by making subtle and not-so-subtle changes throughout the journey. It plays with that feeling when you just know someone was in your room when you weren't there. Sometimes it's innocuous, like a note on the floor that drip feeds the player information, and other times it will be short sequences, like the neighbors talking right outside the front door. Despite how benign these events would be under normal circumstances, being locked away from reality causes these small occurrences to feel like huge events. Peering outside the door, hearing Eileen converse with the superintendent as Henry bangs on the door, desperately trying to grab their attention in vain. It not only gets across the severity of the situation, but also feeds into this sense that every little thing could be of huge significance. 
Speaking personally for a moment, this perception made it so that at times, even the act of turning around after looking through the peephole would give me a palpable sense of anxiety. It made me feel as if someone, or something, snuck up behind me while I had my back turned, even though nothing was ever there. I want to say that it was the intro that planted these seeds of anxiety within me. Maybe, just maybe, whatever killed Joseph would pop up and come after me instead. This experience while playing the game ties strongly with feeling a sense of unease in a place where we should feel safe. In the grand scheme of the narrative, the scene at the door and others like it are altogether unimportant as they tend to only reveal small details. By and large, they do not contain vital plot information, nor do they move the story forward in any meaningful way. Despite that, these sequences can have a huge effect in that it distills feelings of paranoia and, as discussed earlier, anxiety. There are multiple other events in this vein that prey on the player's delusions of self-importance, which culminate into the intended effect. At one point, the television is switched on and can't be turned off. A knock at the door results in being greeted with an ominous message. You can even receive a strange phone call, and once it's over, a persistent noise can be heard, only to find out that it was Eileen sweeping the floor. Yes, strange and supernatural occurrences are happening in the game, but you're not as important or as central as it can appear on the surface. After all, not everything is about you. These oddities are coming about because Henry just so happens to be the one living here, and not because there is anything special about him. They merely feel important because you are the one there for it. If the main character is at the center of any given story, the main perspective character is the focal point with which the storytelling is facilitated through. We all like to think of ourselves as the main characters of our lives, but for most events outside our purview, we are at best supporting characters where we're forced to be the main perspective character given that we're hopelessly shackled by our limited point of view. Now, speaking of Eileen, one of the aforementioned changes that can be observed in the room is a piece of furniture moved out of its place. When interacting with it, it's revealed that there's a strange black hatch behind it with a small hole carved in. Turns out this was created by the previous tenant, Joseph, as a vain attempt to escape. Peering through allows one to see into Eileen's room, and while this is optional, it can be used to spy on her and observe small events, most of which are of little consequence. While it's easy to dismiss this as just a simple activity that can be performed in the room when bored, or even as a somewhat misguided attempt to keep tabs on your neighbor to see if she's okay, the reality is that the player is willfully indulging in voyeurism. Given that the player themselves might be feeling compromised due to being locked away from reality, the clear evidence that someone has been rummaging around in their room while they weren't there, and of course the fact that they're fighting monsters via an Eldritch-style abyss in their bathroom, by spying on Eileen, it's easier to rationalize this as being acceptable behavior, given what has transpired thus far. This interpretation works in Henry's perspective as well, given that he's been stuck in his apartment for nearly a week up to this point. It's fair to say that any of the negative feelings the player has felt up to this point is multiplied a hundredfold for him. Despite how debatably understandable this behavior might be, at the end of the day, it's still wrong. Because in the same way that Henry and the player's sense of personal space is being distorted, so too is Eileen's, even if she's largely unaware. That being said, there are subtle clues indicating that she might not be so oblivious as to what's happening. The black patch on the wall represents being corrupted and willingly spreading it as a result. The fact that it was initially hidden behind furniture is also quite telling, as it relates to the nature of rationalizing our own questionable behavior. In short, you can go out of your way to obscure and deny your shame. But you know what you did. The black mark remains like a stain on your mind. 
When taking all of this into consideration, the anxiety of knowing someone was in your room, the small terror of a presence behind you, as well as the unmistakable shiver down your spine as your mind is clouded by thoughts of being watched from afar, the through line is that they're all tied to our primal instincts. This is because an integral part of the human experience is to associate ourselves with not just our belongings, but where we keep them as they become a part of who we are. When the familiar betrays our expectations, it reverberates within our unconscious mind, an effect that grows stronger over time due to the strength of that association. Given that the majority of us have been conditioned into staying put for prolonged stretches of time, it's then easy to stay in one place and become accustomed to one's surroundings. Because the longer we stick around, the harder it becomes to sever what ties us down. Much like how a young sapling is easy to pluck and place in a different part of the garden, an old tree with strong roots will not comply so easily. Earlier, it was discussed that the nightmare worlds Henry must progress through are distorted locations that exist in the real world. Well, real as far as the Silent Hill series is concerned, at least. But one level in particular that is of note is South Ashfield Heights, the very same apartment complex that Room 302 is a part of. As can be observed, the apartment building is at best a faint echo of its real-world counterpart, as it is almost completely overtaken by an intense overgrowth of death and decay. That is, except for room 302. The striking visual that is the normalcy of the door surrounded by corruption conveys the nature of living in an apartment complex. While this may be the location where your home ostensibly resides, it is completely surrounded by strangers that you don't know. Even assuming you're friends with at least some of your neighbors, nevertheless, even the smallest of apartment complexes are tightly packed with individuals that are complete enigmas whom you will never know or understand, yet are forced to see nearly every single day. Like you, they lead their own lives, experiencing their own senses of joy, happiness, pain, and loss, carry with them their own secrets, and yes, perform their very own rituals in their apartment room. Despite these tenants in many ways being just like you, paradoxically, you're also nothing alike. The layouts of their rooms are ever so slightly off. The furniture is different and in the wrong places. They don't perform their rituals the same way as you. It's like a funhouse mirror, reflecting back a familiar yet distinctly distorted version of the same things you're comfortable with. The message is clear. South Ashfield Heights is not your home. It has and always been only Room 302. At this point in the game, the player has come to heavily rely on their apartment and must continue to do so in order to see the conclusion. But as they say, all good things must come to an end. This largely positive relationship that has been fostering over the course of the game has unfortunately come back to bite us, and it starts with the ceiling fan crashing into the coffee table in the living room. Suddenly, health no longer regenerates, and hauntings emerge at random intervals in order to make life more difficult, as they actively drain health when in close proximity. If the health regeneration represented how our homes provide a mental reprieve from the stresses of everyday life, then the hauntings most overtly convey the psychological damage that can ensue when someone feels that their home is no longer comfortable or safe, wherein locations and objects that once provided a sense of relief now do the opposite. Just as we can conjure these strong, positive feelings of association, they can easily flip to the opposite end of the spectrum given certain triggers. An aggressive argument we have in the living room can permanently stain the mood. 
Tripping and falling in the tub can make showers stressful, and cutting ourselves in the kitchen can make dinner preparation anxiety-inducing. Our mental health is vitally important, and our homes are specifically designed to fulfill basic psychological needs, security, comfort, and a sense of control. When these needs are no longer being fulfilled, it has a direct impact on our mental well-being. The age-old adage, familiarity breeds contempt, brings painfully true. None of the hauntings in the apartment, however, compare to a twist that occurs late in the game. To anyone paying close attention to the layouts of the other apartments in South Ashfield Heights, they might notice that the hallways tend to extend further and contain extra rooms when compared to our own. This entire time, unbeknownst to Henry or the player, there was in fact a false wall in room 302, housing a secret that utterly shatters everything we thought we knew. Beyond this veil of deceit is none other than Walter Sullivan's corpse, the game's villain and primary antagonist. This more than anything represents the core of Silent Hill 4 as it obliterates the false sense of security we the player have built up because even though it should have been obvious from the start, we were never safe to begin with. The concept we call home is a mental construct, and while we can lock our doors and close the curtains, our safety is never guaranteed, and what ails us could just as likely be lurking deep within. Silent Hill 4 is often looked back upon as the weakest entry of the original quadrilogy. And while this isn't wholly undeserved given the less than stellar second half of the game, the byproduct of this dismissal, the genuine brilliance shining through the flaws, is unceremoniously ignored and has since gone woefully underappreciated. While The Room may not have been the best game in the series, the ideas and concepts it put forth were just as thought-provoking as what came before it, and its execution had such a striking potency that 15 years later, I still can't get it out of my mind. And even now, there's an ever so slightly lingering sense of anxiety when I'm all alone on a quiet night in my room. This has been Daniel, everyone and I hope to see you all again next time.